Good morning to Long Island Baptist Church, and a special <clears throat> welcome to those of you who have chosen to visit uh, with us today. Uh, we pray that our church will be a spiritual blessing to you. Uh, we are a body of people who take our worship to the Lord seriously, and we just want to hear from the Lord and hear from his word. I'd like to thank the Lord myself for the good news that uh, Pastor Graf just gave. Uh, that's an answer to prayer. And as Liz said to me, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. So that's a blessing. I rejoice in the Lord, brother. God bless you. Um, I would also like to thank those of you who were aware of the situation uh, for praying for my, my dear sister who lives in uh, Minnesota. Uh, she has, was diagnosed with cancer, and uh, she's taking uh, chemotherapy at the moment. And actually, uh, she should be listening online as I'm speaking. So, uh, hello, Sandy. Uh, your brother loves you, and uh, he prays for you. And I want to thank the church for praying for my sister. I've received texts uh, to that end saying that, they're, that you're praying for her. And I would like my sister to know that there are people in Canada, in, across the United States, and South Africa who are praying for you. And uh, God does hear and answer prayer. That's a blessing. This morning, I'd like to direct your attention to Mark chapter 3. And also, if you will go to Luke chapter 6. We're going to read Mark chapter 3, if you'll stand. And while you're turning there, uh, if I may mention to you, my wife is in North Dakota. Uh, her mother passed away, but she's a saved lady, so she's rejoicing in heaven. Uh, her, the, the funeral in honor of her will be on March 14th, uh, and then on the 15th, my wife will be joining me in South Africa. I'll be flying there tomorrow. I pray for safety for me. Let's read together in Mark chapter 3, verse 1. And he entered again into the synagogue. A synagogue was a place of worship for the Jewish people. And there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him. Jesus, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man with which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto him, unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Imagine that. This is Mark's account of this event. And uh, Luke also was led of the Holy Spirit to record the same account. Now Luke, if you didn't know this, was a physician. He was a doctor. And as doctors do, they pay attention to details, and when they record and log, they give details uh, probably that somebody else wouldn't. And so I would suggest that you read, in fact, we'll turn to Luke, we'll compare some verses throughout uh, to see what Luke records. He does give some details that Mark doesn't. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll trust God to speak to you and me as the word of God is delivered, let's pray. Father in heaven, 
We call upon your name today as we consider your truth, your word, that you inspired and have preserved throughout every generation of time. And Father, this is not any book. It's from the breath of God. There's never been a book like this. It's the only one that you have authored. And Father, as we consider it today, we trust and are asking you to do a supernatural work in the heart of every soul who's standing here today. And Father, we pray if there's a sinner here who does not know you, they've never been converted, never been saved, they're dead in trespasses and sins, we pray for them today. They'll come to know you as Lord and Savior and be born again. Father, bless your people. May we grow in the grace and knowledge of you, and Father, may the hearing of your word increase faith as you said it would. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you. I'd like for us to begin in Mark, and as I said, we will compare, (coughs) excuse me, uh, Luke's rendering. But let's just start in verse 1, and we'll consider these few verses. It's only six verses, and we'll see what God has for us today. The first thing in verse number one, the Bible says, and he, Jesus, he entered again into the synagogue. He entered again. This tells me that the Lord Jesus Christ spent much of his time in his earthly ministry at the house of the Lord at that time at the synagogue, which which was the place of worship. This was something that the Lord did faithfully, continuously. And and those of us who are saved, we have been commanded by our Lord to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. Uh, Maybe there are people here, uh, you would notice that brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so is not here today. Maybe they're sick, maybe there's, there's a reason why they're not here. But if somebody's not in the house of God on a Sunday morning or whenever the church assembles, they, they, there, there ought to be uh, a good reason why they're not here because the Lord is, is not willing to just accept any excuse. And uh, really, we are the ones who will miss out if we're not in the house of the Lord when God has us to be here. I want you to see in Acts, well, actually, if you're in uh, close to Luke, let's go to Luke chapter 4, and uh, let's look at verse 16. The Bible says, and he, Jesus, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and notice, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. As his custom was, Jesus Christ was there. You Go back to Mark, go to Mark chapter 1, and look at verse uh, 21. The Bible says, and they went into Capernaum, and straightway, right away, immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. And, of course, I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here, amen? Uh, But, listen, there may be times when you are tempted not to come to church. The, the truth is, my friend, we ought to be looking for reasons to be in church, not reasons not to come to church. Amen. Amen. We need to be faithful. So back in uh, Mark chapter, th- Mark chapter uh, 3, verse number 1, And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. I always notice, and I've mentioned this before, that so often in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, even among crowds of people, 
His focus is on an individual. Because God is a personal God. And I want you to see that today. I want you to experience that. He, he focuses on a man. And this man had a withered hand. Now, if you flip over to Luke chapter 6, you'll see a detail that uh, Mark doesn't mention, but Luke does. Verse number 6 of Luke 6. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. Okay, now we see that he's teaching. Luke Mark doesn't mention that. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. You see, we get that detail. It was his right hand. Now, I think most people in this world are right-handed. I'm right-handed. Perhaps you are. And to have the right hand withered, uh, that would not be good if you're right-handed. I remember uh, very well when my right arm was cut with a machete and my radial nerve was severed. I'm right-handed, and for, for some time, my right hand was out of use, and I had to use my left hand to do many things, and I didn't do too well uh, because I'm not, right, I mean, I'm, I'm not left-handed. But this man's right hand was withered, and he could not do things like you and I could who have both of our hands working. But here's this man in, in the house of the Lord, and really it's the best place for a sinner to be. In church, if I can say. And verse number two, the Bible says, and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. Here are these people, they're in the house of the Lord, and yet what is their attitude? What is their spirit? You'll find, unfortunately, you'll find people who will come to church with the wrong motive. They have a wrong, a wrong spirit, a wrong attitude. They're in the house of the Lord, and they're watching Jesus Christ. Their eyes are fixed on the Lord. But why are they doing that? They're, they're, they're so focused, they're so fixed on Him, they want to see if He's going to heal this man on the Sabbath day. Why is that? Because they had taken the law and the commandment Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. They had taken that to an extreme to the point where you couldn't do anything on the Sabbath day, especially not heal somebody. And they were going to, they were going to use it as an opportunity to accuse Jesus Christ if He healed. And they would say, you're breaking the Sabbath. And they were looking, they were looking for for, for a justification to excuse the Lord Jesus Christ for who He was. You know, there are people, listen, there are people in this world, and maybe, I hope not, but maybe some in this room, you're in church today, well, that's good. But maybe you're looking for reasons why not to believe You're looking for reasons to criticize. You're looking for a reason not to believe in Jesus Christ, not to believe in God. Trying to find some accusation. That's what they were doing. That they might accuse him. That's not a good reason to be in church. Well, they're there. But they have a wrong spirit. You know what amazes me is these, and by the way, if you compare it with, 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 with Luke, who are these people? They're the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're religious leaders. Religious leaders who are supposed to be teaching the way of God. And what amazes me is they're watching Christ to see if he'll heal on the Sabbath so they can accuse him. But I'm, I'm asking myself, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> are, you not even, are you not even considering the fact that he can heal? Who cares what day it's on? This man has power, supernatural power, to heal somebody. A man whose hand is withered. 
And they're more focused. They're more focused on the day. You know, I just believe that if, if, if somebody has it in their heart to look for a reason not to believe in God, not to believe in Jesus Christ, they'll come up with something. But will it be justifiable in the eyes of God? No. I just can't imagine what it's going to be like for a, a sinner who's been given light, who's been given truth, and they stand naked before God. What excuse are they going to give as to why they didn't repent and believe the gospel? They won't have one. You know what the Bible says in, 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 in Romans chapter 3? That every mouth may be stopped. Well, if, if their mouths are going to be stopped, they must be speaking. They must be giving their excuses. They must be giving their defense as to why they didn't get saved, become saved, why they didn't repent. And God is going to say, stop! Every mouth may be stopped. And all the world shall become guilty before God. It's amazing. They watched him. They watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And again, these were the Pharisees, these were the Sadducees. You know what I found in my Christian experience? And I see it, I see it in the Word of God. Listen, the greatest enemies, the greatest enemies of God and the Gospel and the truth are religious people. I've talked with people. I've, I've tried to share my testimony on, 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 on how the Lord saved me and how He forgave me and, and what the Lord did in, in showing me the truth and opening my eyes. I was blinded. I was a religious boy, a religious teenager, blinded from the truth. I had my religion in which I was raised up in. And then God in His love showed me the truth. And he saved me, and I, I try to explain that to people, church-going people, religious people, people who already say, well, I believe in God. I have my religion. And you try to share with them the truth and witness to them. And they're the ones who resist the truth the most. I remember last week talking about the the, the, the blind man who was born blind from his birth, and Jesus opened his eyes and he began to share his testimony with, with the religious crowd, and they were so offended. Do you remember what they said? Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? Religious people. Religious people will find a way not to believe in the truth of the gospel. They don't, want to be, they don't want to be shown wrong. They don't want their, their false religion to, to, to be pointed out or to be exposed. And they'll look for reasons why. Well, verse 3, And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. Go to Luke chapter 6, please. Let's look at my, uh, Luke's rendering here. Let's start at verse 6 again. And it came to pass also on, on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts. Now Mark doesn't say that. Luke gives these details. He knew their thoughts. And my friend, God knows our thoughts. He knows your thoughts. And he said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Now Mark doesn't say that. Mark doesn't say that. In verse number 3 of Mark, it says, And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, 
stand forth. But Luke gives more detail. He says, rise up. Why? Because everybody's sitting as you are. Rise up and stand forth in the midst. Okay, why did Jesus do it this way? He has a reason. God doesn't do anything for no reason. I think there's, well, I can think of two possibly. There's, there's more, I would, I would say. God's mind is infinite. First of all, this is a case. The Lord's going to make a point to these people who are trying to find something wrong to accuse him. He's going to do it this way to make a point against these accusers. He's also going to do it to make a point with his disciples. But he's also going to do it this way for the sake of the man with the withered hand. <clears throat> Rise up and stand forth. Okay, first of all, in a crowd, who's seat, you're all seated. If somebody stands, they're already going to stand out, aren't they? They're going to stand out. I, didn't, I just noticed that. They're going to stand. Yeah, like that, right? <laughs> Is your hand withered, sir? <laughs> okay, if somebody stands up, they're going to stand out. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, arise and, and stand forth. In other words, I want you to come stand forth in the midst. I want everybody to see this. All right, here's, the, here's what Jesus is going to do. All of you accusers, he knew their thoughts. Watch this. Take notice of this. Disciples, disciples of mine, I'm just going to remind you who I am. And for the man, he's putting him to the test. Are you willing, sir? Now, I'm just paraphrasing some, some thoughts here. Are you willing, sir, to stand up? Are you willing to come forth in front of all of these people? Are you willing to obey me? Are you willing to trust me? Are you willing to, 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 to have the, 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 the light, the spotlight on you for just a moment? Or will you stay seated, hide in the crowd? Will you be ashamed? Will you not want to be associated with me? Or are you going to do what I say? This man had a choice to make. You know, there are people in this world, they don't, they don't mind, I guess, in some ways being called a Christian. They don't really advertise it. They don't really want to be, uh, they don't want it to be made public, necessarily. You know, that the attitude is, well, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, that's, that's just kind of a personal matter. We, we just don't, I, I don't really want to talk about my faith. I don't really want to get in a discussion about my faith. I don't really want to, to be, you know, to be promoting my faith. I really don't want to, to be closely associated with Jesus Christ. Now, if I'm going to put a, you know, uh, fill out a resume or an application and they ask me what my religion is, uh, yeah, I'll check the box. I'm a Christian. I guess because I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a Hindu. I'm not an atheist. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll put Christian on there. This man had a decision to make. Is he willing, is he willing to, be, to stand out in the crowd? Is he willing to obey the Lord? Is he willing to become a spectacle, as it were? Arise and stand forth. You know what Jesus said? If any man is going to be my disciple, he must deny himself and pick up a cross and follow me. You know, a cross in Bible times was an instrument of execution. It's where somebody went to their death. It's where somebody was willing 
and, and, and probably in most cases unwilling, if they were thieves, criminals, but it's where they were put to death. And Jesus is saying, if you're going to be my disciple, you must willingly pick up a cross as I did, and you must willingly go to your execution. In other words, you must be willing to, to, to give up your life, your goals, your ambitions, who you are. You must be willing to give up your life for mine. You must be willing to arise and come forth and be associated with me. That's what the demand was for this man. And then when he did that, because Luke's, Luke says, uh, when Jesus gave that command, rise up and stand forth in the midst, and he arose and stood forth. He did what Jesus said to do. And then the Lord asks a question, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Now why is Jesus asking this? He's asking this because of those people who were so concerned about the fact that it was a Sabbath day, it was Saturday, that Jesus was going to heal. He's actually asking this question to confront their false religion. And let me say this, my friend, if you are ever to come to the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved spiritually, to be a child of God, to be born again, if, if, if you're going to be saved, if God, if you're expecting God to receive you and to give you that forgiveness, to give you that supernatural birth, my friend, you have got to be willing to repent of your false religion. You know why, beloved? Because false religion is idolatry. That's idolatry. You know, when I was exposed to the truth and I learned the truth of how I was to be saved and born again, I realized that the religion in which I was raised up in was false. I was taught that when my parents had me christened, I'm not going to call it baptism, that when my parents, as you know, so many months old, when they had me christened as an infant, that's when I received forgiveness of sins. In fact, I remember learning the catechism, Martin Luther's catechism. How can water do such things? And, and then the answer in the catechism is, well, it's not just water alone, but it's water with the Word of God. And somehow, when you speak the Bible and you have the water that's sprinkled or poured on the baby's head, somehow there's some supernatural hocus-pocus and the person receives forgiveness. That baby. That's not in the Bible. You don't, find, you don't find infants being baptized in the Bible. That's what I was taught. I, also, I was also taught that the Jesus that I was, that I was taught and raised up in the Jesus, the, the, the Jesus that, that, that I supposedly was believing in could not keep me saved. I could be saved and lost. I could lose my salvation. Jesus Christ could not keep me saved. That's against the Bible. I, you know why? Beloved, because the Bible teaches that when a sinner comes to the Lord and is born again, God gives that person eternal life. Amen. Eternal. It's also referred to as everlasting life. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God doesn't give a repentant sinner a gift of salvation and then claims it back. What would you think if somebody came to you and said, I want my birthday gift back that I gave you? 
What, what, what do we, no, it's mine. <laughs> God doesn't do that. But that's the Jesus that I was taught. In other words, the devil could get my soul again. And if the devil came and challenged the very Son of God for my soul, Jesus would, would see Satan and... Ah! Guess I won't do that again. <laughs> Excuse me. No, you've got to be willing to repent of false religion. This man needed to arise and come forth. And Jesus put the question to these religious leaders who were wanting to accuse. And this man had a decision to make. The Bible says they held their peace. And when he had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. That's in Mark chapter 3, verse 5. I've often wondered what it would have been like to be in the, the crowd that day and beholding the Son of the living God, and looking at Jesus Christ as he looked round about them with anger. What would his face look like, that expression? Because of the hardness of their hearts. It must have been a gaze. It must have been a look that so communicated God's anger. And why was he angry? Because of the hardness of their hearts. May I encourage you, don't harden your heart against the truth. My friend, you cannot fight against God and come out the winner. Well, he said, stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Right before their eyes, he was standing, they're seated, he's standing, he's in the midst, and they watched it happen. You would think that would have convinced the crowd, the people. to see a miracle like that. You know, people, there are those sitting here today who've been saved. There are sinners who've been converted. There are sinners sitting here whose lives have been supernaturally transformed. And some of you have seen it. You've seen it but you haven't believed. My friend, you need to know you're hardening your heart against God and the truth of God. And God is angry. How did the Pharisees respond to this? And the Pharisees went forth in verse 6 and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Imagine that. They watched the man with the withered hand. They watched his hand. He stretched it forth. He was standing in front of all of them. It was made whole before their very eyes. And the Bible says, in fact, if you flip over to Luke, I want you to see the wording here. Look what, how, how uh, Luke describes this. In verse number 11, And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. 
Luke says it was madness. Mark says they're seeking a way to destroy him. When the truth was evidently put forth before them, and they saw it, and Jesus was teaching, and they heard truth, and for these people it didn't persuade them. Can I ask you something? What more do you want? What more do you want than hearing the Word of God and seeing the lives of sinners being transformed, people's lives who've been changed? What more do you want? Let me mention this and I'll be finished. Do you remember last week if you were here again with the man who was born blind and the Lord opened his eyes and when he came back seeing, if you recall, Jesus had already dismissed himself. So here was a man who was healed physically. His eyes were opened. He did what Dr. Jesus said to do and his eyes worked now but he wasn't saved. And if you recall, it wasn't until Jesus found him in the temple and he asked him, do you believe in the Son of God? Something like that. He asked him a direct question like that. And he said, Lord, who is he that I might believe on him? And he said, it is I who am speaking to you. And then the the response was, Lord, I believe, and and the Bible says he worshipped him. That is when, right there, that is when he was saved. That's when he put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But before that, he had never seen him. He hadn't seen him yet. He had never laid eyes upon him. He didn't know who he was. Who is he, Lord, that I might believe? And Jesus says, I I am he. I'm he. I'm, I'm the one. And he believed on him and he worshipped him. That's when he was saved. Now you know what I noticed in this case with the man with the withered hand? He did what Jesus said to do. Dr. Jesus, the great physician, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Well, he had a physical healing. But I don't read in Mark's account, and I do not read in Luke's account where it went any farther than that. I do not read any comment. I don't read a statement. I don't read of a testimony. I don't read where this man believed in Christ for his soul, salvation. I don't read anything like that. I don't even read of a response of what this man did or said. And if that's really how it, how it ends, this man, he had his hand restored, he had a physical healing. But that only lasted until the day he died. But what, af- what happened after that? You know, this man whose eyes were opened... What if he had died before he ever saw Jesus? What what, what would have happened to him had he died before he ever realized who Christ was and and put his faith in Christ and worshipped Christ and submitted to Christ? What would have happened? Well, he would have died with, with both eyes seeing, but he would have went to hell. And this man, he experienced the physical healing good for him. But it doesn't say where he put his faith in the Lord. It doesn't say where he repented. It doesn't say where he believed in Jesus Christ and worshipped him. Why is this something to be considered? Because listen to me. You may be here today and you may believe 
You may have convinced yourself that you're on God's side because you prayed and said, Lord, heal my boo-boo, heal my injury, make me feel better. And you know something? Maybe you went to a doctor and they helped you feel better. Maybe you were cured from, from, from some terrible disease. Maybe physically your health is, is better than what it was because you submitted to the prescribed treatment. But that doesn't mean you're saved. That doesn't mean you're a child of God. You must be born again. And you need to examine your heart, my friend. You need to examine your heart. Why do you believe you're a Christian if you say you are? Why do you believe you're going to heaven if you say you are, if you believe you are? Why are you thinking that that, that you're on God's side? If it's not a biblical testimony, if it's not repentance and faith, if it's not because you have turned from from sin to God, if it's not because you have put your faith in the crucified one and the one who who, who died and was buried and rose again for you, if it's not because of the blood of Jesus Christ that, that washes away sins, if it's anything but the Gospel, my friend, you're lost. Even if you experienced a physical healing, What are you trusting in? Who are you trusting in? You need to examine your heart. I'm just telling you, if if you don't have a biblical testimony, God will reject you on judgment day. And eternity is a long time. We can't afford to be wrong. Amen? We cannot afford to be wrong. God loves you and God brought you here today to hear truth. And consider it. If you have any questions about your soul salvation, please ask. We're here to help you. Amen. Thank you for your kind attention this morning. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you today for the Word of God. Where would we be if we didn't have a Bible? If we didn't have truth on a written page that we could hold in our hands and read, we would be in darkness. Father, it would be as if we're in a black room looking for a black cat that's not even there. We would be lost. Thank you for the truth. And Father, I'm I'm so thankful that we can go to the Scriptures and we can see clearly who Jesus Christ is, who your Son is, what your intention is towards sinners. You came to seek and to save that which was lost. And Father, what a tragedy that a person could witness and see the working of God in a person's life and yet reject it for themselves. Father, if there is someone here who has never been truly saved, they don't have that peace and assurance that heaven is their home when they die. They fear death. May they seek the Lord while you may be found. And Father, may your people, may we be bright, burning, shining lights to those in darkness. May we be good testimonies to lead them to the Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me today?